Welcome to our invited talk slash tutorial um, on CraftBots. It's a novel um, benchmark environment for integrated planning and execution. It's accessible, adaptable, lightweight, and it's got lots of different scenarios and features, but I'm sure Michael Cashmore and Ludvika Namiro will tell you all about it. So um, just without further ado, I think we should pass it over to uh, Michael and Ludvikas to teach us about CraftBots and tell us how it can be used as a possible planning and execution competition environment. Take it away. Okay, thanks Victor. So I've got um, a few slides to present, not many, just to give you sort of intro as to what the, the simulation is and what it's for and a few ways it can be customized. Uh, and then we're going to move into a kind of hands-on section uh, where Ludwig's also in the room somewhere and I will uh, be able to help you sort of play with the simulation, test out the API, and then if you want, uh, build a simple agent uh, to work with it. Uh, but I'm going to first of all attempt to share my screen. I want to share the whole screen. Okay. And I can't see you anymore, but if you can see my slides, please let me know. We can see the slides and if there's anything in the chat or um, any questions, I will let you know. Perfect. Well, also Ludwig's here, so you can answer those, hopefully. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so here's a quick outline of the, the slide portion of this tutorial. I'm gonna start with the introduction to the simulation and go over some of the configuration options that uh, you can use. Um, then I'm gonna go into the competition part which, and describe um, how we would like to use this CraftBot simulation as a competition for combined planning and execution systems. And, and then we'll move into the hands-on part. Um, in the meantime, if you want to have a quick screenshot and download the code and, uh, and run it, these four commands here will, will clone the repository, um, get the requirements installed and, and run it. And you'll find that it should only take a couple of seconds and you can, you can follow along. Right, let's start with the uh, introduction. If, if you need the, the link to the GitHub repository again, then uh, Ludwig can give you that in the, uh, the chat. Okay, so what is CraftBots? It's a, a multi-agent team simulator uh, to evaluate and benchmark integrated planning and execution systems. It's kind of um, an abstract logistics domain that's loosely inspired by the uh, RoboCup Logistics League that Tim presented here at ICAPS a few years ago. Um, the main uh, motivation for developing it was for us to have an execution, uh, an evaluation um, environment to test various ideas in. It was quite customizable, but also very lightweight. I, I got tired of using uh, ROS for everything and installing Gazebo and having these sort of heavyweight simulations when what we're really interested in testing is kind of the planning and symbolic execution part of our system and not so much the kind of combined task and motion planning parts. So it's that kind of high level simulation. Um, it's very easy to use. You can download it, run it. You just need Python and a couple of libraries which you can store with PIP. Um, but to actually do well in it, it's, it's really quite difficult. And uh, we've got one test agent, which I've evaluated and I'll show you the results of that later and explain why the results are bad. Uh, okay. So the things we think you could use this simulation for uh, First of all, for evaluation, I think the most useful way in which I'm going to be using CraftBots is to run experiments on, on future papers that I want to submit to Intex. Um, but also because it's so lightweight and the API is quite simple, I, I think it's appropriate even to um, present to first year computer science students who you want to teach algorithms to. And you could ask them to write an algorithm for solving CraftBots. Or if you wanted to give this to a, a more advanced uh, class who are learning AI, you could uh, ask them to combine, uh, connect something more, you know, some sort of search-based algorithms that they've already written to, to solve this. Um, I've already used this in one of my classes. I asked them to make a PDDL domain for it and connect uh, their PDDL domain to the simulation with some kind of executor. And uh, I got some agents executing plans on the simulation, so it is possible. Uh, and of course, the last thing which we think that you can use it for is, is a competition. And really, that's just um, more in the spirit of the QBF evaluation where uh, we would like to see different um, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches compared together in a in a single simulation 
Um, just because there are so many different things out there, this would be a, a nice way to um, get it all in one place. Okay, so this is uh, what the simulation looks like um, if you're able to download it and run it, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Um, in the center here, you can see uh, is the map, which is made up of nodes and actors. Actors are able to move between these nodes uh, in order to complete tasks. And you can see some tasks over on the, on the right-hand side. Are you able to see my mouse? Yeah, that's good. Um, tasks are, are located at specific nodes. In this case, node zero has a task. The task is to construct a building there, and the building requires these resources in order to construct it. And if you construct it, you'll score these points. Okay, and in order to get the resources, you have to mine for them at these mines. Uh, and now let's take a look at the actual thing running. Okay, so here it is. So I've got a very simple configuration set up here. We have actor seven in three nodes. There's a mine of each color and there's one task to complete here in node three. So you're able to view node labels. Here we go. So node three is this one at the bottom. And if you complete this task, you score 20 points. And there's no deadline for this particular task. So I'll hit start. And the agent that's currently running is the uh, kind of simple rules-based agent that, we, that we've that um, we included in the repository. OK, so it's not a very clever agent. Oh, no, sorry, this is not the right agent. I knew there would be something going wrong. If you'll excuse me for a moment. Testing things right before the uh, tutorial is always a bad idea. That was not the uh, rules-based agent. That was even a simpler agent that simply moves randomly. OK. OK, so now the agent is digging at um, one of the mines. And if I turn off this label, we can see that the new goal is at node zero, this node here. Uh, to build a building which requires a red, an orange, and a black resource. And this building has, has been begun, but nothing's been deposited into it yet. So it's currently mining. Let's just slow this down a tad and keep going. Start. Right. It's picked up and deposited the, uh, uh, the resource very quickly. So it's going to be hard to see. And now it needs to move away to get this orange resource. So It'll dig here, an orange resource will appear briefly. We picked it up, it's in the inventory, and then it deposits it. Now it's constructing the building. And when that's complete, you'll see that the score appears up here. A few other things on the uh, interface is you can you can toggle on or off the uh, various log info here. It's also saved to a file. And you can turn on or off labels. Um, but where I'd like to spend most of the time really is to show you the configuration options. So the configuration options can be the easiest way, I think, to modify them is through this configuration file. Uh, but they're all saved as YAML, so you can uh, simply use a uh, text editor if you prefer. So for this tiny configuration, what I said was that we'd like three nodes um, and uh, the following parameters for generating the, a probabilistic roadmap. So let's just change this to 10 nodes, and I'll show you some different things. Um, you can change the number of actors, of course. Actors are able to hold uh, a number of resources equal to their inventory size, and there's a few other things you can change. Uh, and if I was to reset this, you'll see now we have a, uh, a much different, there we go, a, a different setup, a different set of tasks. Um, apart from the world setup, an important uh, configuration option here is under the run configurations. Uh, obviously, the simulation length and the simulation rate can both be changed, so we can make things run much faster and for a less period of time. Um, and also, we can run in and out of lockstep. Uh, this is the one I want to explain in the most detail. Um, lockstep, if true, uh, is going to mean that the simulation will only tick one step forward before it asks for more input from the agent, and it will block while the agent is thinking. Um, if you want to run any kind of realistic integrated planning and execution, you need to leave lockstep off so that they're running in separate threads, the agent and the simulation. 
and the agent has to make its decisions in real time. The reason this is an option um, is to allow you to uh, speed up the simulation uh, to, for running sort of very quick but rough evaluations. When we come to talk about the competition uh, simulation, the way in which we were going to evaluate the agents is not with lockstep, actually in real time. So we, we have a, a machine with a lot of cores that we can run things on in parallel, so it won't take uh, many days to run uh, thousands of simulations. But um, it is something to note that as soon as you change from real time to lockstep, you'll get radically different results. And in fact, by, even by changing the simulation rate, um, that's essentially changing the, the, um, the rate at which time passes in the simulation, but not the time, um, the processing speed of your agent. By changing the simulation rate, you will get different results as well. Okay. Uh, and finally, I'd like to show in the world setup here that you could, you can sort of fix things with a random seed here. So let's just use this uh, random seed of 789. Uh, and if I hit reset, you can see it doesn't, doesn't change anymore. Okay. Let's take a look at the uh, competition facts. Uh, so on the repository, we've included two configurations, which we think are quite interesting to try and tackle. Um, the baseline one, is, I think it's called simple configuration on the repository rather than baseline, uh, but it's by no means entirely easy. Um, Goals are going to come in online in a similar way that they did in the uh, RoboCup Logistics League. The goals have deadlines and your agents will be oversubscribed. So you, part of this um, that is different from simply planning offline is going to be deciding uh, which tasks are going to maximize your score. Um, added to that, there's temporal uncertainty. So that is the duration of actions will be uh, varied. And I'd like to show you just the configuration options there. So let me load that in. Simple configuration. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned uh, tasks coming in online and temporal uncertainty. So I'd like to show you just a quick overview of those configuration options. So first of all, under tasks, um, we have three kinds of tasks, easy tasks, hard tasks, and medium tasks. Uh, and you can give them a different weighting. So these are the probabilities that each newly generated task will be of, of each one of these types or a, a relative weighting, not a probability. Um, the new task chance is the chance per tick that a new uh, task will be generated at a random node. And the you can specify for each uh, easy, hard, and medium how many resources and how many different types of resources that task will require. Okay. Under temporal uncertainty, uh, you can choose that each of these actions is or is not temporally uncertain. By default, everything's switched off here. Uh, so let's just switch on the movement one. You can choose the overall standard deviation of movement actions and also the per tick standard deviations. You'll see we've selected them both. What this means is that the act of speed, which is currently one, uh, this means that it's going to move a sort of a one edge length per tick. Uh, is going to be varied uh, by first, when it begins the movement, sampling from a distribution with mean of one and standard deviation of 0 0.8. And then per tick, the actual amount that it moves in that tick will be varied from that base rate that was calculated by 0 0.3. The reason it's done this way is so that, first of all, there's, a, um, uh, there's no way to, after the, a single tick of movement, to immediately read how quickly the agent is moving, and if it's moving too slow, cancel the action and try it again. Okay. Um, so we really wanted this uh, uncertainty, to be, uncertainty to be per tick. Um, but uh, if it were only per tick, then over long distances, we found that it kind of averaged out. Uh, so we have a, an overall standard deviation that's initially kind of hidden, and then a per tick standard deviation. And if you were to keep making readings of how far the agent has progressed along that edge length, it actually will converge to its true speed and you could cancel the action if it's going to be moving too slow. And that sort of corresponds to um, my experience on a, a physical robot. Okay. So it's just to explain the baseline com, uh, configuration. We have these online goals, we have task deadlines, we have temporal uncertainty. I, I think I could just run the, uh, the agent on that in the background there. 
So again, this simple rule-based agent uh, I'll show you in a moment is, uh, is not really doing anything intelligent. It's just assigning each agent to a single task and completing that task in a very straightforward manner. You can see on the left, sorry, on the right here, the tasks, you can see their difficulty, the required resources, they also now have deadlines. And when the deadline is reached or the task is completed, they'll, they'll vanish. And um, most of them are not being completed in time by this agent. The advanced configuration uh, extends this to action failure and resource properties. So let me go back to the configuration. I'll load in the advanced config. Yeah. Reset. And I'm giving you a lot of um, information about different config op configuration options very quickly, but it's self-documented, so you can read through also in your own time and uh, refresh your memories. So the main difference here is this non-determinism tab now has non-zero values, which is the chance of failure for different actions. So travel per tick, uh, chance of failure. When you try to pick up an object, there's quite a high chance of failure. I've set that the zero chance of failure of dropping it to be kind and, and so on. Um, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, and resource properties. The resource properties are what make this problem particularly difficult. Uh, so I'll, I'll rather go through them uh, over in this slide. So the, the resource uh, properties uh, can be enabled per resource type to, oh, I don't have a, excuse me for a moment. See, there's a chat thing there, is that? Uh, That's just me putting the GitHub book again. Okay. Oh, unfortunately, I cannot annotate the screen on Linux, so I'm going to have to I'm going to have to point to things with my mouse instead. I apologize. The um, the five resource types each have a different property that you can enable in order to make the problem more difficult for both execution and planning. And I think in some cases, even modeling the planning problem in PDDL gets um, particularly difficult. Um, so the first property, uh, black heavy, just indicates that um, the actor can only hold um, a single black resource and nothing else. If the uh, actor is already holding other resources, trying to pick up a black resource will fail. And if the, uh, the actor is holding a black resource and tries to pick up another one, it will also fail. Um, and this just puts on some extra resource limitations. Blue extra effort um, increases by a factor the time it takes to mine the blue resource. So that just includes a sort of bit of temporal variability between the types of resources there. Um, red interacts with that. Red collection interval specifies time intervals within which the red resource can be mined. And if you try to mine outside of those intervals, the action will fail. Um, you can specify repeating intervals of, of any kind of size. Uh, and this adds some interesting temporal constraints to the execution of a plan, especially when you've got that temporal uncertainty enabled. Um, the green uh, resource, uh, after it is mined, can be set to decay after a set number of ticks. So you could set this, for example, quite low and say that after you know, 100 ticks, the green resource, once mined, will vanish unless it's already been used to construct a, a, and complete a task. But obviously, in combination with the red collection intervals and the extra time taken to mine the blue, um, the green decay time adds some interesting planning complexity into there, um, but it's also a tricky thing to model if you don't have continuous processes in your modeling language. Uh, and finally, the orange um, resource uh, requires multiple agents to mine it at the same time. So in this case, it's set to zero. If I were to set this to two, for example, in order to mine an orange resource, now three agents or three actors rather will need to come to the mine and work together in order to produce that resource. Um, and that of course is including some uh, cooperation constraints here. Okay. The, I think that covers the two different configurations. So the baseline configuration is a fairly simple logistics task with uh, temporal uncertainty and deadlines. And the advanced configuration sort of turns on all all of the different things. You have action failure as well, and you have these resource properties, which just make the problem much more difficult to complete. Okay. 
Okay, and, and here's some just sort of details on uh, exactly what's in those configurations, but I can skip past these slides since I showed you the, the actual screen instead. Okay. Uh, one thing to note, in both of these cases, the map is fully observable. Um, we do have a tab here for partial observability. Um, if you set any of these to true, the, um, the API will only return as observation to your agent uh, anything that's within nodes where your actors are present. Okay, so if you switch, for example, um, edge and node partial observability on, uh, you now have to explore the map. You won't be able to see any edges and nodes where your actors uh, aren't presently. Um, I think one thing that's interesting here, for example, is you can switch on simply task partial observability, but keep everything else fully observable. And this allows you to uh, test sort of inspection and maintenance scenarios, right? So you could, um, uh, you, you need to explore the map and, and you can also prepare for things, but you don't know where the tasks are until you arrive there, inspect that node, and then you'll see that there's something to fix. Okay. Right. So if you have, uh, let me switch to the wiki page for a moment. Okay, so uh, the GitHub link is here, which hopefully will be shared. Uh, we have a discussions page where you can talk about, um, and an issues page where you can talk about features that you would like or, or bugs that need to be fixed, for example. Um, but there's also a, a, a wiki here, which will give you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to connect an agent. I won't go into a lot of detail on this right now because I'd rather do it in the hands-on part. Uh, I just want to explain sort of very high level how we would propose you um, uh, connect an existing planning and execution agent to the simulation. Essentially, uh, there's a single Python class which needs to be extended that talks to the agent API. And the agent API uh, has methods for sending commands to your actors and returns an observation either in the form of a world information dictionary, which you can see the details of on the wiki, or you can call a method to query specific information from that dictionary. Um, what I would propose would be to extend this uh, class as an adapter that is listening to the, the actions that are normally being sent by your planning and, and execution system and adapting them to the simulation. Uh, I, I expect it wouldn't take too many lines of code, but it really depends on the, on the agent. Sorry, one way. Right, my slides. Okay, we set up um, a sort of rolling submission for uh, proposing um, planning and execution systems for either the baseline or the advanced configuration. Um, if you want to have us evaluate one of these, uh, you can send a, an email to intextcraftbots at googlegroups.com, including the information shown on that slide, so sort of a name of yourself or the system if it has one, instructions to us for how to run it, uh, and any links to a GitHub page, a repository, a paper that you have um, and want to be presented online. Uh, and any results that we do um, generate, we will put on craftbots.com. And this includes, I don't think this includes just research papers and you know, extremely sophisticated planning and execution systems, but um, I, I think this is a nice sort of master's project or uh, undergraduate group project you could propose and, and have students get involved in something like that as well. Okay. And I said, I, we have run one evaluation so far, which is sort of baseline results for the um, rules-based agent. Uh, the rules-based agent I mentioned is simply assigning tasks as they come to a free agent and having that free agent attempt to complete that task in a very straightforward way. That straightforward way is to collect the resources one by one and deposit them immediately into the, uh, the building site and construct the building once they're all deposited. Uh, it doesn't do anything clever like collecting multiple resources while it's uh, on a single trip out. Um, and you can see that sometimes actually the agent, in this case here, it, it solves quite a few of the different tasks that were generated and sometimes it solves none. And I think what I expect to see as uh, more sophisticated planning and execution systems are evaluated is not simply a higher average score, but in fact, less variance in the scores that they're getting. So the rules-based agent is required, essentially relying entirely on luck, hoping that the tasks that it's picking from the, the, are the ones that it can actually complete. 
um, and that the uh, the role of the dice when it's performing its actions uh, is favorable in terms of temporal uncertainty and non-determinism. Okay, these results are actually are slightly out of date, but uh, you get the picture. Okay, that's, that's all of the, uh, the slides. Hopefully I got through those pretty quick. Perfect. Uh, and what we'd like to do for the remainder of this tutorial, if you're, if you're game for it, is um, to get hands on with the simulation. So either to um, open up rules-based agent and try to modify it and improve it. I think there's plenty of ways you could do that in 10 minutes. Um, or just to play with the configuration options a bit. Uh, or if you really would like to try to connect an existing planning and execution system that you have to it now, um, we're on hand to, to help out.